And that, combina- that is key <coughs> to what we're trying to, what we want to do at UGT, to really give, to enrich our teaching experience by bringing the world outside into the classroom so we don't we are living, living in an academic cocoon, so to speak. So I think I must thank you, thank those who have visitors for coming in as well, because what it does is actually expose our students to the world outside. Very, very important for us. It's very important in preparing students for getting into the world of work when they leave here. So with that, I, I want to say I hope you have a very, I know you have a very formative lecture. And someone said to me once, the sign of an educated mind is being able to entertain many views without accepting any. So it's very, very important that as we go through life, we listen to all views. And not necessarily accept, but we listen to all views. So with that, I will hand you over to Mr. Lucky, and I want to tell you that we are very, very grateful and appreciative of having a man of his eminence here with us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I feel you come back up and get something I want to ask him. Mr. IT, has he left us? Okay. I think this is my one. Oh, not at all. Just one moment. If I want to get back to the original thing, what do I do? To the original. Before I come to maps, there's, a, there's something on the computer. Go here. Mm-hmm. Click. Huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. Right, and then I can pick up what I want. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Okay, thank you very much for your patience. I'd like to begin by telling you this, that it is my view that it does not make any sense for anyone to keep all his knowledge or what he has learned over the years to himself. I was just um, telling you the distinguished um, distinguished colleagues and lecturers here that the last time I spoke to an audience there were about 350 to 400 people in Beijing and I was shaking like a leaf and I had to tell them that I was not experiencing, we weren't experiencing an earthquake, it was just me shaking. Similarly at the UN and like here, when I sit with all you brilliant academics, the same way, no matter how many times you've lectured, you do feel nervous. And I usually get over that in about two, in about two minutes. And that two minutes is almost up. So what I'd like to share with you this morning are the views, as you will see there, on aspects of the law of the sea. And the, the topic I chose for this morning is the legal and socio-economic advantages of being an archipelagic archipelagic state with specific reference to Trinidad and Tobago. As we all know, the surrounding sea is extremely important to us because of the vast resources in and under the sea. These resources are vital to our economy and sustainable development. Oil and natural gas exploration and exploitation, fisheries, tourism, sport, communication, and shipping. All of this is extremely important to us. And during this lecture, I will show you and demonstrate to you how it all began, where we are, where we are, how it came about, and how important it is for us as Trindigonians, or as some people say, as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and others, the archipelagic state of Trinidad and Tobago, 
how the sea is important to us for our economy and for the development. In this first slide, you all know it. This is the political map of the Caribbean. And you see Trinidad and Tobago at the end. I'm just, I'm just looking for the pointer. <laughs> I'm gonna find out which one to press. But, um, until, until I do, you'll see Trinidad and Tobago at the end. Now, the second one I want to show you is this one. It's the strategic location of Trinidad and Tobago in the Atlantic Basin. And the blue lines show you the, from Trinidad and Tobago, where basically we export our natural gas and to a smaller extent crude oil but mainly natural gas yes and basically natural gas why because you will see in the activity map here what, where our natural resources are. Those that are in red are natural gas. And you see it here, and in another map I'll show you, when we deal with the unitization agreement between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela, where we share in one of the fields down here. Now, it is well known in Trinidad and Tobago that there are many who feel that Tobago and Trinidad should share the resources in the sea. There are several in Tobago, and I was there lecturing recently, who see the flares out there and here and across here. And there are some who feel this belongs to Tobago. My own view, and this is personal, whatever the resources are here, or here, or here, these resources belong to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, why did I choose this topic? Because to start off, I will show you that Trinidad and Tobago is a small, archipelagic state. And as an archipelagic state, there are certain rights that we have in internal waters and rights we have with respect to the measurement of the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and the exclusive economic zone. And I'm sure, and I will look around, and give me a nod if you don't, and you would have heard of the 200 mile exclusive economic zone. And you would have also heard of the continental shelf and how far the shelf goes out because it's a natural prolongation of the landmass up to a depth of 200 meters or where the slope be be begins. So actually, it may go beyond 200 miles and applying the definition from here, taking our boundary, we go out up to 350 miles before the shelf ends because Trinidad and Tobago is part of the continent. I say this because in the recent case between Bangladesh and Myanmar, I was one of the 23 presiding judges. Um, if you really look it up on the, and Google it, you will see that one judge dissented. And although he agreed in principle 
with the general judgment, he dissented on the interpretation of Article 76. And the arguments were extremely interesting when sitting as a judge from Trinidad and Tobago, the lead counsel in answering Professor Pele, who was for Myanmar or Burma, he said, and we'll develop it later on, quote, Trinidad and Tobago shot itself in the foot when it signed in 1990 the limitation treaty with Venezuela. And, unquote, the reason being that, oops, pressing the wrong thing. The reason being that you know the Orinoco flows here, and this Orinoco Delta Shelf contains the largest hydrocarbon deposits in the world. We used to share in all of this down here until the boundary was changed. If those of you who have access to the library at the University of the West Indies, and you go to the special section because there are only two copies, and read legal problems of the law of the sea between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela, you will see that the limitation line drawn in that thesis took us further south, southeast than it currently is. Um, I am not an egotist, but the thesis is written by Anthony A. Luck. And at that particular time, I can assure you that the then government had access to that thesis because the author presented it to the then Prime Minister. just have to get a bit of help here, so we will continue to go to bullet points. So, and then we'll go up to, I'm um, here, yeah, full story, well. Better stay here to help me. Um, you can have copies of this. This is an interesting piece that I came across, because in 1857, Trinidad and Tobago had drilled the first oil well in the world. And in this article, you will see that when the author of the article met, not to the end, when the author of the article met, right, met the, when, when the author of the article met the Americans, he pointed out that he attended a geological expedition, expedition to the well in 1971. And when he visited it, what he saw was just the remnants of what was left. And he suggested very strongly that it should be a heritage site. Actually, the 1857 well, because it says here two years before Con Con um, Colonel Drake drilled in Titusville, Another enterprising prospector by the name of Walter Dowent tried his hand at drilling close to the oil seep near the world famous Pitch Lake in Trinidad. Dowent successfully drilled and produced oil in South Trinidad using the conventional methods of the day. When they realized what was done in the United States, they gave him a copy and they gave him some oil. And they said, since you were the first, you should have it. Now, I'll show you here, if you could go to the bullet points. To bullet points. Huh? Yeah, not to the, no, not to this, to the, right. So, 
Okay, it's not that I want. Give me back to the beginning. Pull up that. This is the first offshore rig. You can move it up a bit. That was commissioned in 1954. I remember as uh, just entering my teens, I don't think my brother Andrew was born yet, but my father drove us down in his truck down to see that. To see this. And this was the commissioning of our first offshore rig. And among the people, those of you, well, you young people wouldn't know, but the then person, this person here, and you could look it up, was Albert Bertie Gomes, who was the minister then. And he went offshore, and with him was His Excellency the acting governor of Trinidad and Tobago. We had a governor in those days, you young people. Um, there was a governor, and he went with them, with Albert Gomes, for the commissioning of this first oil well. This document will also be available to you all. If we could go back to the bullet points again. Right. And uh, this one. Okay. Now you keep in your mind that first rig that we saw. Now, that's today. This is the NGC. Repsol Teak Plantation. So from that little rig that you see, that is what we have now. And I believe it is about 15 miles offshore. The other one was just a few miles. So I thought I would show you so you would see a comparison of then and now. Now remember I told you, this is 15 miles offshore. That's from if you're in Mayaro, where most of you go, if you're standing on the beach, you'll see it, and it's 15 miles off. So you'll come in your mind straight away, wait, wait. But we have a territorial sea of 12 miles. So they're 15 miles out. We're outside the territorial sea. Others will tell you, yes, but we are in the exclusive economic zone. But in the exclusive economic zone, you have sovereign rights over the super adjacent waters to the seabed, and subsoil. Seabed and subsoil comes under the continental shelf, and I will deal with those definitions shortly. So we are in order to be there. So bearing that in mind, come back to the original. You see, look at this. That, what you're seeing there, here, compared to that, what you young, what you young people will call a rather archaic bit of wood and steel put up offshore. But that is where we have reached in technology, and those of you from the engineering departments will surely appreciate that. So we go back to the original, okay? And um, take me back to bullet points. Okay. Now, So, having looked at that now, what I want to bring up to show you at this particular point is back onto the topic, the archipelagic principle. This is set out in the Archipelagic Waters and Exclusive Economic Zone Act of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'll just read you the preamble. It is an act to declare the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago an archipelagic state, and to define the new areas of marine space appertaining to Trinidad and Tobago in the exclusive economic zone, 
and the archipelagic waters and the nature and extent of the jurisdiction to be exercised by it in each of these areas and to make provisions for matters connected therewith in accordance with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. This act was passed in 1986. Now, why is this so important to all of us? Let me go back to the bullet points. This is extremely important to us. The reason is this. When we pass the Act, and it's prescribed in the Act, and the Convention prescribes that whenever you declare an archipelagic state, you register it with the United Nations, and therefore all the nations are aware that we are an archipelagic state. Nobody's objected. There are 162 states parties to the convention, all of whom have signed it. And those of you who are interested, I will leave this in your library, and you will see when Trinidad and Tobago signed, and when the other Caribbean states did. The 1982 treaty was signed on the 10th of December 1982 by Trinidad and Tobago, and it was ratified in our parliament on the 25th of April 1986. And just to do a comparison with our Caribbean brothers and sisters, Barbados signed it in 1982, 10 December, and Barbados ratified it on the 12th of October 1993. Those of you who are interested again on Caribbean countries will see that Grenada signed it in 1982 and ratified it in 1991 in their local laws. So just to give you a few examples of our Caribbean um, brothers and sisters, how they approached it. It's a pretty long list and it comprises 162 countries. And you will see that Trinidad and Tobago took a very early part in this. Now, you'd ask yourself, why am I showing you this? The Archipelagic Act drew these lines. And in the Act, you, it prescribes that your baseline must not be more than 150 kilometers. So what do you have in this? The first that I'm showing you here is the lines according to our act. All of this here and here, within these lines, as a straight line I'm showing you, are internal waters of Trinidad and Tobago over which we have full sovereign rights. For example, if you, just to give an example, if Mr. X goes in his little fishing boat off Toko, and he takes a boat from Tobago and he seizes the engines and he steals the fish and the Coast Guard come around and they arrest him and he's taken before the court, the laws of Trinidad and Tobago apply. And he has committed a criminal offense inside our, ter our internal waters. Why is the line important? And how it is drawn is also extremely important because in talking about the archipelagic state, the lines are drawn as follows. And I'm sure you've heard of these various islands from which they are in Tobago, East Rock, Casa Cruz Rock, Alcatraz Rock. There's actually a rock up here called Alcatraz Rock. It's not a prison. Ikakos Point, right down at the bottom there. Then you all will know Black Rock in Tobago. Cabarets Point, Cabarets Island, Sisters Island, Marble Island, 
little and little Tobago of which we all know. So the line is drawn that way. And it's in accordance with our law and international law, the law of the sea. Now, why, you would, sorry, you would ask why are these lines important? Because the law prescribes that in drawing your baselines and from which you take your baseline and from that line when you are measuring your when you are measuring your territorial sea of 12 miles you draw it from there so the territorial sea is that line that I show you on the outside here so picture in your mind the activity map that I showed you earlier you would see that inside of our territorial sea, and I say our, Trinidad and Tobago's territorial sea, within the 12 miles, there are rights that we have there. Now, when you go to the exclusive economic zone of 200 miles, you measure from there, and there, and there. And you go out until you meet another state, if you picture, the original map that I showed you. Now, let me repeat. I am not a politician and I have no ambitions to become one. I prefer what I am, a judge and an international judge and somebody who is in the academic field as well. Now, I started off by telling you that my interest began when I looked at this an act to amend the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to enhance the internal self-government of Tobago. During the contribution in Parliament, I happened to be surfing, and I saw the leader of the opposition making his contribution. If the leader of the opposition was sitting in my class and I was a lecturer, and he was dealing with this based on his contribution, I would have given him 9.5 out of 10. The 0.5, they never give 10. And I think you all know this. You never, you never give 10. And what I was concerned about is that he looked at clause 141F, and in it, it says, that the powers of the legislature, etc., etc., shall have effect within the confines of the island of Tobago, its offshore islands, and such part of the inland waters between Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago and Trinidad of not less than 11 miles, measured from the nearest points between the two islands, and such part of the territorial sea of Trinidad and Tobago of not less than 11 nautical miles, measured seaward from the baselines of Trinidad and Tobago as determined in accordance with Section 5 of the Territorial Sea Act. As I repeat, I'm not a politician. But as a legislative, qualified legislative draftsman, and I'm not an egotist, but I am the, in the governing body of the International Journal for Legislative Drafting that comes out of London. So I looked at it as a draftsman. Those of you in the petroleum, and I'm sure most of you here are much better mathematicians than I, because I never did maths at E level, and I just scraped through a pass at O level. But I am trying to figure out how you get 11.5 miles from there to there, which is about 100. How you get 11.5 miles from there to here? Well, it's 23 miles, so you divide by two. How you get 11.5 miles from baselines when we are an archipelagic state? How are you going to measure it from there? So, as I said, in his contribution, Dr. Rowley wondered, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do the measurements? Because in every single act, you have to put the latitude and the longitude and it sets out each of the points that I told you on all of these points, what they are. 
and you have to do measurements. So you cannot just draft a bill, present it and say, well, let's go in. Because you are giving food to the lawyers who would come afterwards and challenge it. And as far as I remember, it was a long time ago, lawyers' fees are quite high. And the only ones who gain all of this are the lawyers. So presumably, I think it would be the end of this. I am pro Trinidad and Tobago. I am pro the unitary state of Trinidad and Tobago. And I feel that whatever, and if I could go back to the, I'm going to try and do it myself. If I can go back to the, to that map there, let's see. If we can go back to the activity map, you will see that, you know, who, who does this block belong to? It belongs to Trinidad and Tobago. Applying the law, I am not talking politics here. I am speaking about the law. I'm speaking about the archipelagic state. When we run down here with this line, from there to here, are they going to say, well, from Tobago, let's measure here? And we are you a unitary state. So what is here belongs to Tobago and Trinidad. What is here belongs to Tobago and Trinidad. It is a duty of the economists to sort out how and who is going to get what. And you have to give proper instructions to a drafts person in order to set up a proper draft which everybody would understand in the circumstances. Now, so I am not slamming or battering anybody, but I'm just saying that if I, if you all were in a drafting class in the University of the West Indies in the, in the, doing your LLP, and you produce this draft to me, I will give you two marks for effort. <laughs> and I'm very serious about it. Two marks for effort. Because it does not make sense. And what I learned when I was being trained as a draftsman uh, many years ago, what we were told is do your draft and R.E.M. King, who trained people throughout the, the Commonwealth, what Pofer, I think, now deceased. But what he did say is you take the draft and you put it down and come back in about a week. And when you look at it again, you find that you drafted something that does not make sense. And you have to do a draft with two documents in front of you, your Constitution and your Interpretation Act and therefore you do it as such. So he tested us and gave us a draft to do it, one which I enjoyed. It was an anti-noise act, an anti-noise bill. So we drafted it and you took it, it was just six of us because he liked a small class and then you have the others take it to pieces. And when I took it back after three days and looked at it, I said, no, you didn't draft it because it doesn't make sense. So this is why I am stressing now, it's so important that we retain our status as an archipelagic state. If you could go back to the... Okay. Um, if you could go to... Um, <laughs> Oh yes, interesting. Come up to the Lorraine Manitay. This one. This one? Yeah. I'll just show you the title here. This is the Unitization Agreement for Exploration between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela of the hydrocarbon reservoirs. So go back to the opening again. To the yeah. Right. Uh, no, the bullet points. 
and if you could come, go down. No, no. Um, you should give me your reality. Go down again. That's all. Yeah. That's all. Um, this one here. It will take a little time to come off. What I wanted to show you is how we divided. It's not coming up on this. No. no. Yes. Just be a little patient. So while that is coming up, what happened is Trinidad and Tobago signed this unitization treaty with Venezuela in order to get a little bit of the, of the gas that exists there. Now, you will see here that this is the 1990 boundary. The 1990 treaty divided Trinidad, the limited the shelf between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. This is a little bit of the Venezuelan coastline, but this is the agreement, and you'll see the line running this way. The red areas are gas. The green would be oil. But the big gas fields are here. This is all part of the Orinoco Delta shelf. In legal problems that are brought the sea between Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela, you, with the use of cartographers and surveyors, who were then, that was then known as the Ministry of Petroleum and Mines, and the author got access and to the use of them, and using the equidistance principle, because this is the Venezuela coastline, this line in that thesis ran here and then up, so that the belly continued. When we signed the 1990 treaty, the Venezuelans insisted that they wanted access to the Atlantic Ocean, and they didn't have it because Guyana was coming with its shelf from there. So we gave in, and Venezuela got the access through here. What we got was that. And in the treaty, Trinidad and Tobago gets 26% of the gas, and Venezuela gets 74%. And in another area, even more. But beggars can't be choosers, and we had to accept it or get nothing at all, because it was a period of negotiations and the negotiations culminated in that. What I want to point out to you, it's a bit small, but you see all the coordinates here? Those are coordinates that you have to do whenever you are using the equidistance or you are using the equidistance principle adjusted or you are using, as I pointed out in the Myanmar, Bangladesh is what is known as the angle by sector method, which involves, for you young people, you may have to do it one day, the use of mathematics, the science of maths, and you combine that with geographical circumstances and everything else. Using the angle by sector method, my delimitation line between Myanmar and Bangladesh was the same coordinates as the other line used by the majority, and they used the equidistance principle, but the convention always says, in order to arrive at an equitable solution. So they took the line and adjusted it to arrive at an equitable solution and came plump on the angle bisector method. So it was basically the same. But when I looked at this as an academic, 
and a legislative draftsman, and I looked at 141F, and I looked at the whole thing. I looked at it to the back when I first got it. I even turned it upside down. I didn't see any coordinates. I didn't see any measurement. I didn't see any baselines. And now, if you, so you understand the law humanity. Now, if you go back to my archipelagic map, archipelagic map. Oh, yeah, no, the, it's not on that, yeah. I ask, where are these lines? Where are these lines? Where are they? You, you, you have to do the thing. You've got to get it right, or you don't do it at all. And I am not bashing anybody. What I am saying is, let's get the thing right. Now, we go on to the other point, which is the limitation. Tobago says, well, let's delimit the area between here and there. And when I delivered three lectures in August last year in Tobago, there was a division and a hue and cry where some people said, man, we think it's time Tobago separates from Trinidad. And we do our own thing because we have gas and oil. So what's going to happen? We cease to be an archipelagic state. So that goes through the window. And then Tobago decides, well, let's see how divide things between Trinidad. Where are you going to run the lines? What are you going to do? So from a legal point of view and applying law, it seems that we will benefit more as Trinidadians if we remain as the archipelagic state of Trinidad and Tobago. This is based on how I view the law and the current law. Rumor has it that this bill will not be represented in that particular form. And I am extremely happy about it. Now to do a little comparison, um, if you could pull that up, I decided to consider whether there were any other similar, any other states that are similarly, similarly circumstanced as Trinidad and Tobago. If you go right down to the bullet points. At the end. Um, that's all it has there. Mm -hmm. right, if you go back to my original notes. Yeah. Um, come down. Yeah, yeah. Map. No, motor map, yeah. This is our page. Mm -hmm. It should come up. That map should come up, yeah. Not coming up. I go back, go back. Yeah, no, go back again. It, Malta is an archipelagic state, but what I wanted to get was the um, the map of Malta. One of the things that I do have to do is to learn how to be um, computer literate. Yes, there we are. If I didn't have this good gentleman, I'd be in trouble. Um, let's look at that. Let's look at Malta. It's an archipelagic state. Now, does it, and I'm going to pose a question, does it remind you of any other archipelagic state? Well, the question answers itself, rhetorical. We just saw Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Malta comprises the big island, this, and the little island. The divisions you see here are all what we call the local government districts. And they have also divided it. So as a small archipelago, you will see that their baselines, which I didn't get hold of, run across here, up to here, across this, here, down here, 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 
and it will come back to this point here. So they would have the internal waters. So just picture Trinidad, Tobago, Little Tobago, etc. They are similarly circumstanced as we are. They were a former colony. They got their independence and their system of government is similar to ours with a constitution. They do have a president and a prime minister and a government and local government. But I brought this up just to show you that they are very similar to us. And those of you who are doing political science will go on that it has a system of government since 1993 based on the European Charter of Self-Government. <coughs> they have 68 local councils, 54 on the main island, and 14 on the other. Now Trinidad and Tobago, in, when you look at Trinidad and Tobago, it's not 14, it's 12, and then we have a big amount here. But I'm not leaning on the political side, I'm just showing you that they are similarly circumstanced to Trinidad and Tobago. So, in considering all these matters pertaining to the law of the sea, you would ask yourself, well, you know, what about Trinidad and Tobago? You know, what have we done since independence? And since attaining independence, we continue to make valuable contributions to the law of the sea. And that there are many nationals who continue to make positive contributions. And I won't name any because you would have heard of people like um, Mr. Francis Charles, an ambassador. You all would have heard of uh, former minister and ambassador, Notes and Gift. You all would have heard of various people who have made valuable contributions. Um, in this development. What I do have with me here, and you see how difficult it is, this is a book, and those of you who are blessed Espanol will be able to read it. It's a book written by Professor Morales Paul of the University in Caracas. He was one of the chief negotiators when we, we were doing that, when we were entering into the agreement of the 1993. And it's interesting from the point of view that Morales Paul pointed out in the book how various areas should be divided. And he said in it that the only criticism of that 1990 treaty was by a gentleman whom you all know called Mr. Patrick Manning, and he gave him two full pages indicating his criticism of that 1990 treaty and why we should not have signed it. And what he basically said is that, and in Spanish, forgive my pronunciation, rootification a Patrick Manning. And in it, he then pointed out what Patrick Manning said about the treaty and why he did not agree with it. And Trinidad and Tobago had a very powerful team that we sent there, headed by Ambassador Nolson Gift. We had about 15 people who went, and Venezuela had five. Um, the names here, we had Ambassador Gift, Ambassador Christopher Thomas, names you all know, Mervyn Williams, Francis Charles, Ms. Patricia Sobian, Kenrick Haynes, Anthony Paul, Philip Seeley, former Ambassador to the UN, Stephen Kangal, Foreign Service Officer, Wilfred Nymol, Lennox Bala, Advisors. So you heard that whole list. Gori Singh, Mrs. C. Henry, Mark Run, Kerry Singh, Donald Ragunath, Jefferson Davidson, Chairman of the Tobago House of Assembly, Assembly, Patricia Sobian, Solicitor General, it's good. This is a big long list. And I looked for a long list from Venezuela. And the Venezuelan list, this was Dr. Isidro Morales Paul, Jose Velasco Colazo, Pastor Farias, cartographer, Jorge Daha, technical advisor, and, Mark, and 
the Brando Martel. One, two, three, four, five. Five against this massive delegation of Trinidad and Tobago. And according to Professor Crawford, we ended up shooting ourselves in the foot and giving away about 200 million US dollars in gas. But such is the law, and we are bound by that treaty. Further to it, that whenever you sign an international treaty, of course, you are bound by it. And after the break, I will deal with the something that you may only wish to ask, but the break will be in about five or ten minutes. So if any of you wish to ask any questions, disagree with me if you want. Agree to disagree. Tell me, look, um, if we had to mark you, <laughs> and I always look to see where I went wrong, um, based on from one to five, a young lady who apparently knows everything gave me one. And maybe that was my effort. <laughs> but no questions were asked by the particular individual. So are there any questions you want to raise on what I have just done? Excellency, an observation. Sure. Um, maybe the question of that treaty in, in 1993. 1990? 1990. Yes. The demarcation between Venezuela and Trinidad and Tobago may have been more properly resolved by some degree of public And you just give your name. Joe Burbank. Uh, I don't know whether probably what we should have as a norm when, when, when you're changing the status quo on something that is so impactful that the public should be consulted by way of a referendum, some sort of very large and involved public consultation, so that even if the government still has the final decision. A body of views would come to inform that decision more fully. I think it's a very good comment. And if I may refer to when I got the introduction, which I kindly asked, how do I address you as professor or doctor? <laughs> when, when I was introduced, the point that was so well made is that he looked in the direction of all of you and he said that he hopes that what was said in this lecture would be taken to other places so that you would be more informed. And the point made just now by um, which is Mr. Bennett McDowell, the point made by him just now is how much do we know about the archipelagic state of Trinidad and Tobago? How much do we know about it? It seems to me that virtually nobody, nobody is concerned about knowing more about the law of the sea. And in Trinidad and Tobago, they have a habit, and I, I, when I'm giving a serious lecture, I, I don't try, I try to leave out humor. But I remember once making this point to some distinguished, learned gentleman. And the comment was, oh, you're still with the law of the sea, or are you at sea with the law? And everybody laughed. And that was the end of it. Now, when that comment was made, it was about 10 years ago, and I immediately buttoned up. You know, I said, well, if they don't want to know more, why should I? But take, for example, you know, Trinidad and Tobago. We're Trinbegonians. If such a bill where you are amending the Constitution comes up, we are, are we all expected to pay and have cable and look at the parliamentary channel and see what is going on? Or how much of it appears in the media? What we, have, what we hear in the media, and I'll be quite frank and open, what you see in the media is 
Oh, so and so says so and so about so and so when they were discussing um, Tobago. Peacock being thrown from side to side when you are dealing with a very, very important point. It's extremely important. Do how much do we know about our archipelagic state? How much do we know, or are we going to leave it to the politicians to sit back and say, well, you take that, and you take that, and you take that, and you take that. Well done. Trinidad and Tobago, accept that. Thank you very much. So we have to be informed because, as a very dear friend of mine said, he said, Anthony, you have to remember, you know, you're in the departure lounge. I said, yes, I'm usually in the departure lounge, in the departure lounge because, you know, I have to leave, or when I have to leave and go abroad for two weeks to deal with a court. He said, I don't mean that one. I mean the other one. So I said, which other one? He said, the departure lounge, you know, where all you fellas go when you cross 70? Because after that, hopefully you'll go up and not down. And then he clicked. <laughs> it is you young people. It's for you to say, look, this is my future. My future. There's no more, but well, there, there, there are no more fines of oil on the land. What we have is just going on. What is out there is in the sea, and we have to be very interested and we have to protect our rights. Next question. Mr. Pallet Barry. International relations and foreign policy is hardly ever appearing in the manifesto. So the public really does not know what any government will be promising with respect to its international relations. And secondly, some very serious treaties are being signed in the cabinet. They're not being brought to the parliament for debate and ratification. And that poses a serious limitation to the knowledge of the population. Now my question is, it goes back a little further with respect to Venezuela. You can guard Venezuela has a perpetual claim on about two thirds of Ghana and I believe at some time Venezuela also looked at the eastward and said, you know, that's going to be part of Venezuela. Now, what sort of problem that has caused for the draftsmen of boundaries and so on with respect to uh, economic zones and territorial seas and so on? And this is a question I want to Yes, I, I personally think it's an excellent question. Firstly, our immediate neighbors on the sea side involving the law of the sea, and you're correct, Venezuela, Guyana, Grenada, to a small extent, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and the Barbados. Now, at the moment, we have the 1990 treaty with Venezuela, and as far as I remember, there was no public consultation. They sent a team across there, and I gave you the names just now, and that met with the Venezuela team. They drafted, a document was drafted, it was presented, it was taken to the parliament, it was, as you remember, 33-3, and it was passed. And we accepted it. It's being criticized now, but there's nothing we can do about it. We entered into another treaty. If you could pull up the thing. Recently, um, in April 2010, Trinidad and Tobago, let's look for Grenada. Go up to UTT. No, go up to the UTT thing. Mm -hmm. Grenada. Liberation Treaty between. Yes. You remember that one? The delimitation treaty between the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Grenada. 
on the delimitation. And there was a delimitation line drawn in accordance, Trinidad and Tobago says, with the law. And it was signed and brought to the parliament in April 2010, because the election was in May 2010. And I remember there's a bit of grumbling that why was it rushed? Grenada is now saying that they got the raw end of the deal, that Trinidad got the better of it, but it was duly signed. And what Grenada is now asking our ministry, and again, the people don't know, it is all secret and hush-hush, unless somebody is doing research like me, and you go in and you find out. What they want is a similar agreement to the unitization treaty with Venezuela where you share the expenses. And Grenada says, look, you're more rich than we are, so you do everything and we'll pay you back after. And I think that's what they're negotiating now, a unitization. Come around the other way, and we go back to the, to the original map, to the beginning, yeah. Come right down. Come down again. Come down some more. Right, hit this one. The top one. Yes. See that one? Um, point down. We have another, we had another problem. Again with Barbados. And we entered into an arbitration agreement. In 2003, this was the first time when um, Judge, His Excellency Judge Lennox Bala died. He died in April. And Trinidad and Tobago wanted to hold the post. They didn't want to lose being uh, their membership. And they didn't want to lose being a judge on the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And at that particular time, they pulled a the judge out, me, and said, Judge Lucky, look, we think you could hold this seat for us. And I was elected on September the 3rd, 2003. When I happened to be, and I'll condense it, I went up there meeting 20 legal luminaries from all over the world. And one of them came to me and said, do you know, and they suggest things with, with each other. Um, and you formally asked, Judge Lucky, do you know that um, a case will be coming to us between Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados, to which I said, what? They said, yes, don't you know that um, the Attorney General, Mia Motley, a name, you know, was up here. And she was speaking to the President, and they were organizing um, an arbitral tribunal. He said, have you all, under Article 2, and under Article 287 of the Convention, have you made a declaration stating how you would like your matters to be resolved? So normally they make a declaration stating the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, International Court of Justice, so you make that choice. But if you have not made a choice, you are deemed to all accepted arbitration, which is a fact. And you all will recall the public were told that Prime Minister Manning was going to meet the Prime Minister of Barbados and they were going to resolve the matter. And he was due to go on Thursday. So I went back to report that I had come back. So I said, well, Minister, don't you know that Barbados is going to file against us? And I was told, no, look at what delegation outside. And our ambassador came and said, listen, this matter may come to you, so don't say anything. And the Prime Minister was due to fly out on Thursday morning, and Barbados hit us with it. Whack. They filed an arbitral uh, for arbitration. Having filed, they said, Trinidad and you can't do anything because you did not make a declaration. So we spent 25 million US dollars on the arbitration fees. Barbados, according to the parliamentary um, reports, according to Hansard, they, they say they spent 15 million on their lawyers because, and we, your people should know this, when I first went there, the judge from Ghana, Judge Thomas Mensa, who was a former president of the court, he said to me in his beautiful Ghanaian accent, Anthony, 
If they make you an happy traitor, you must take it because you can print your own money. Now, imagine I had just come off. <laughs> I had just come off the judicial bench. Bench. I am still in the framework of locking up people for fraud, sending people for long jail terms. So I said, wait, wait, wait. I said, wait, Judge Mensah, it's, it's against the law. He said, no, what I mean is that you get so much money because an arbitrator gets 500 US per hour. 500 US per hour. And if it's in London, 500 pounds an hour. So, and I, I said, well, how long per day does an arbitrator work? He said, well, a minimum of six hours per day. Six fives in US. So it cost us a lot. So I said, no, oh, no, well, if you came to our court, you don't pay a cent. The judges are already paid. All you pay are your lawyers. So it would have cost Trinidad and Tobago about 500,000 and Barbados 500,000 because in the arbitration you share. What happened, Mr. Badagari Singh, was this. If you look, oops, yeah. If you look at the screen, that's Barbados, that's us. That's what Barbados claimed, you see? They came very near to Tobago. And with all due respect to the council, the Barbadians said, all is mine. <laughs> I think the, the, if I may refer to in this carnival season, so the Barbadian said, all is mine, all is mine. Well, all didn't come out mine because this is what the arbitrator has decided. I just wanted to show you what Barbados, I don't blame them. If I was in Barbados, I would have done the same thing. This is what we are bound by. And you see how they drew the lines? Did you see that? In this, in this bill. So they took a point from Barbados here and they drew the lines coming down to here. What Crawford forgot is that they didn't put the archipelagic principle. It, it was not raised by our lawyers and Barbados had some very good lawyers. We had Crawford and they had the creme de la creme. So this is what happened. So this is the line that we are bound by, Mr. Father Gary Singh, and you are bound by it. So if you notice, in coming out with the archipelagic principle, we are being blocked here by Barbados, and we go down to here. And then what was done, and since the question was raised, Guyana and Barbados, just at that time, you're, you see somebody from Barbados is here, she recalled. They entered into an agreement and they filed it at the UN. And they drew a boundary from Barbados coming down to here. And Guyana said, beautiful, we're going from here to there. So you see what happened? We boxed in. And they said, Trinidad and Tobago, sorry folks, you could reach as far as there, we're not going any further. And we said our shell goes out 350 miles. And they said, wait. You can't. But in what is regarded now as the second known sea continental shelf case, this is the case between Bangladesh and Myanmar, what we decided was this, and it's important to us, and it was used because I don't interfere in politics. I sent the judgment to an academic and one of the lawyers at the Ministry of Energy. The lawyer handed it to the minister. And I got a message in Hamburg that the minister sent his thanks for the judgment I had sent to him. To which someone who was very close to me said, but Anthony, I told you you do interfere in politics. How come the minister came to thank me for what your husband, well you guess who it is, what your husband said? But you didn't tell me you sent it. So I said, well, I didn't send it. I sent it to the academic. But she did the correct thing. She gave it to the minister. And what is interesting, and bear this in mind, young people, they declared an exclusive economic zone of 200 miles. 
running that way. And they said, Trinidad and Tobago, sorry, you can't go. But the act is very clear. Our act and the Exclusive Economic Zone Act. And under the convention by which we are both bound, it says quite clearly that the Exclusive Economic Zone is 200 miles, and that is very correct. And the Exclusive Economic Zone goes out for 200 miles. And what the rights you have, the sovereign rights and the Exclusive Economic Zone, are the following. You have the rights to the resources in the sea, above the seabed and subsoil. So, in the exclusive economic zone, which they've done there and there, and Barbados, of course, goes out further, they have rights, but not to the seabed and subsoil. That's the continental shelf. So what we did in the Myanmar Bangladesh case, something similar came up. Bangla, Myanmar said, no, 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 we have 200 miles. Where are you all going with your continental shelf? And we said, the continental shelf extends. So the question was, but are you blocked by the exclusive economic zone? And the full court held no. And it was called a gray area. And we have what is called a gray area here because Barbados and Guyana share the sovereign rights to the resources in the sea above the seabed and subsoil. Trinidad and Tobago has sovereign rights, the continental shelf. So what happens? We set out our big rate and Barbados and Guyana said, we terrorists are get out of our own And we say, okay, but, you know, the shelf is ours. So the convention says you try to get to an equitable arrangement where they will say you could do the shelf. So what happened with, in Myanmar and Bangladesh? Bangladesh says, we have the shelf. Catch all the fish you want. We're not going to catch any. We see our fishermen taking it, lock them up. But don't touch the resources. Don't touch the resources. And it's rather like, again, in this season, um, those of you who say that Calypso is not dead, it's still a bit alive. There was the Bajan and the Trinidadian, and this is the only bit of humor you'll get from me, who decided to cook uh, pilau. And the Trinidadian put the rice. The Barbadian put the rice. The Trinidadian put the meat. And when they went to sort it out, the Barbadian said, you could take your rice, but don't take the meat. So, you know, how do you divide the two? But it can be done. And in the gray area, in my dissenting judgment, I told and I don't think that uh, Myanmar Burma was very happy when I said, if you own the shelf, then obviously the shelf comes first, and therefore the waters above it would be included, and all the judges is brown. But similarly, we, in this situation, we could tell Barbados, take all your fish you want, but don't touch the oil and gas. And just to end off on this note before the break, they decided, I'm going to answer. I thought this was um, oh, it's not work. They decided that Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados in the arbitral award should enter into a fishing agreement called the Flying Fish Agreement. And that agreement, they said, you should sort out because Tobago fishermen, when I gave the lecture, Tobago fishermen are saying that the Barbados trawlers are coming down here and taking the flying fish. Because fish are migratory by nature, and the flying fish moved to more this area, all around here. And they came down. And you'll remember the case some years ago where we um, seized the Barbados trawler and they arrested the fishermen. 
who for some reason or other, everybody was released. And so they made that suggestion. A flying fish agreement was drafted and was sent to the ministry to send to Barbados to say, let us get the comments now and see how we can sort it out. That, um, you know, if you catch fish, how much Trinidad gets and how much Barbados will get. Um, I have a copy of the flying fish agreement that was in August given to the members of the TJ. I have a copy of the agreement, draft agreement, which was sent to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, when I went to visit the ministry, I went to look in the Z file to see if it was there. The Z file is the bin. Um, I don't know where it's gone. But nobody has asked anything more about that flying fish agreement. We have not entered into any agreement. And hopefully it would not happen as happened with Myanmar and Bangladesh until they entered into an agreement that the navies of both sides want both sides want to blow each other out of the water. And they stepped in and entered into an agreement. So, you know, there are some of us who wish to help Mr. Paragari Singh hear about it. You offer something. But as I told those who came up and with whom I was introduced, Sir Hugh Winning told me when I just came back, all the young lawyers went to meet the Chief Justice. And he said, remember one thing. When you're charging fees, charge high fees, because the client will think you're good. If you go to anybody and you say you'll do it gratis, they don't worry with you, because they think you're no good. So maybe the next time, I will ask back for my agreement. I will say, kindly pay me $20,000. And when they pay it, give it to my favorite charity, which is not me. And I'm sure you will see the following fish agreement come about. So it's there. But I suppose they'll wait for an incident. So we are bound, Mr. Paragdari Singh, on all sides by Grenada, Venezuela, and Barbados. Yes. Excellency. Um, do we have a right of passage to the United States? Yes. And, um, a right of innocent passage. Innocent? Yes, all states have the right of innocent passage. Meaning that we can't send our vessels with the intent of war with us? Well, in peacetime, but why the United States has not signed the Convention on the Law of the Sea? is that if a submarine or any armed vessel is passing, they are supposed to inform you. But otherwise, you have the right of innocent passage. And when I deal with the Libertad case, and the St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Spain, I'll be touching on it. So if you own the continental ship, and someone else has the control over the exclusive economic zone, and you're going to put a ring for the purpose of drilling, do you have a right of passage for that? You, you have a right of passage, but if you're going to put up a rig, remember you are on their waters and you have to get a license from them. And one doesn't think that they will object it. It's a good question. One doesn't think it. We have a nice relationship with Barbados. We're playing cricket together and losing, but um, we have a nice uh, relationship. Those of you in the Faculty of Geography, would know that there's a geographical meaning ascribed to an archipelago. And geography, as pointed out in the judgment of Judge Lucky in the Myanmar case, that geography and geology plays an extremely important part in arriving at a legal definition. And just as an aside, you know, Parliament can do anything except change a man into a woman. And that's a quotation, a famous quotation. Now, applying all of this, so just picture that we have a top geologist 
in Trinidad and Tobago, and somebody smiling, they know who the person is, who has a degree, and I think a master's in geology. Am I right? Good. Now, in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, of which we are a state's party, when I say we, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, an archipelago means a group of islands, including parts of islands, interconnecting waters and other natural features which are so closely interrelated that such islands, waters, and other natural features form an intrinsic geographical, economic, and political entity or which historically has been regarded as such. Trinidad and Tobago has natural features. It forms an, an intrinsic geographical, economic, for the economists here, and political entity. So this is the description in the law. And then it goes to talk about <coughs> how you draw your baselines. And it says, the breadth of the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone, and the continental shelf shall be measured from the archipelagic baselines drawn in accordance with Article 47, which I just read. And you draw the lines, baselines join the outermost points of the outermost islands and drying reefs of the archipelago, provided that within such baselines included the main islands and the area in which the ratio of the area of the water and the area of the land, including atolls, is between one to one or nine to one. And the length of the baseline shall not exceed 100 nautical miles. Bear that in mind. What does our act say? I'll put it up on the screen. This act, this act, and forgive my back, young people raised the point. You notice the opening? It declares that the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago an archipelagic state. And then it goes on to talk about appertaining the, the exclusive economic zone, the archipelagic waters, and the nature and extent of the jurisdictions shall be exercised by it, etc., etc., etc. So you see, basically, that we are incorporating what is set out in the convention. And then now, it goes down slowly. You see, now look again how we Trinidad and Tobago has followed the definition I just read for you. Means the political entity of Trinidad and Tobago comprising that group of islands. You see the same definition, which are so closely integrated from an intrinsic geographical and economic entity. So all the state parties, 167, they are all part of a green to this. And then it says what the archipelagic waters are, the waters enclosed and drawn in accordance with section six. Screw now. It talks about con um, conservation, etc. Then continental shelf shall have the meaning assigned to it. And the Continental Shelf Act, our Continental Shelf Act incorporates what is set out here again. So go right down to the end. If you don't mind, I'll take you down to the end. Let's go slowly. Right, hold it there. Now you see here what they have done based on the definition. Are you following it, young people? If you don't stick your hand up or stand up and say, go wait again, I don't mind because it's important to us. East Rock, latitude, longitude and all the islands are named where they are. Go down again. That is the law. And that is what we, showing archipelagic baselines of Trinidad and Tobago. And as Mr. Allen pointed out, it is from these lines that you draw your territorial sea, as I showed you earlier, 
your continental shelf, your exclusive economic zone. And that <coughs> is the relevant law as it pertains to the archipelago, to an archipelago. While we are still on it, Mr. Arne raised a point. You have the exclusive economic zone. It's an area beyond and adjacent to the territorial sea. Our law has it. Subject to the specific legal regime established in this part of the convention. And it says the breadth of the exclusive economic zone shall not extend beyond 200 nautical miles. And it goes on to tell you that you must conserve your living resources and <coughs> that how you must comply with the laws, it deals with, with the whole question of artificial islands, that the state has the exclusive right to construct them and to authorize and regulate the construction, operation, and use of artificial islands installations. Sorry, yes, Mr. Patterson. The, the line on the western side of the Gulf there, does it mean that the water is inclusive on the right hand side? is what we call a total water. Where is the boundary of the Median Line principle between Venezuela and Trinidad on the western side? Um, the boundary on the western side of this Oa Archipelago is in accordance with the 1990 treaty, which I could bring up shortly. But it's, they have roughly based it on that line. So the boundary will be, I think they took the boundary as this. So Venezuela would be there. Because this comes pretty close. They would measure from here to the Venezuelan coastline and depict it on an equidistant principle. But when you see the treaty, you will see that they just worked out the lines as to how they wanted it. So the line between the silvers and the dragons of the water inside, the gulf that has already this is in This is internal. But originally, in the Gulf of Paria Treaty 1942, and I'll quickly touch on this historically, we were then a colony. In 1935, Hans Suter, Swiss geologist, indicated he was one of the advisors, and he told them that there was a massive oil field here. But in 1935, and in his book he put it, he said, make sure in that treaty you get that area. Because in 1935, you will not be able to take oil from the sea, but technology is such that you will be able to do it, and I'm quoting from his book, you will be able to do it in the near future. And that is why Venezuela were not happy in the Gulf of Paria Treaty when we came down here and we took this area of Soldado. And in Soldado, I feel we're still getting oil. And it is said, that the Venezuelan delegation was chastised for having agreed to that because Venezuela didn't know until after it was signed, just after the war, that there was a big oil field there. So the, that's the exclusive economic zone, and it tells you how you to utilize the fishing resources and the relationship with highly migratory species, etc. Now, coming back to the archipelago, <coughs> it says the sovereignty of an archipelagic state extends to the waters enclosed by the archipelagic baselines drawn in accordance with Article 47 as described. And the sovereignty is exercised there. So we have, as Trinidad and Tobago, sovereign, total sovereignty inside here. Is that clear? Now, let me pose a question. Do you all see the significance and advantage of being an archipelagic state? What, what do you think? Yes, I see intelligence coming from you. You think from a, sorry, let me get you correct, that <clears throat> the resources should be shared.
Yes, but the economists will have a wrong time. Because look at it this way. Under the Constitution, I'm posing this question to you. I just want to get the young people to you. Anybody else can answer. Under the Constitution, what are you and I? We are citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Therefore, under the Constitution, we have the rights set out. What you call the, some people say human rights, but we have all our rights and rights of freedom of the press, freedom of this, freedom to earn a livelihood. All the freedoms are there. The recognition of rights applies to all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, in Venezuela, President Hugo Chavez has said more than once to the international companies that the resources in Venezuela belong to the people. And that is why he charges five cents for a gallon of gas, five US cents. I think they screamed when he raised it to seven. So he said it belongs to the people. From a legal point of view, and you are correct, the resources of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the land and in the sea, which includes the living and non-living resources, belong to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, to you, to me, and to all the Tobagonians here. They are, I'm sure, but it belongs to all of us. So I see a bit of a difficulty, but if, the, if the, you always instruct the draftsman and you say, well, draft up this thing for us, a draftsman would say, how can I divide up things when it belongs to everybody? You grant internal seven government and they say, okay, we want to make regulations and we want money for ourselves. Where's the money coming from? And the money must come from Trinidad and Tobago. It's a, it's a difficult thing. You'll have to see how you can adjust it. And the economists, with all respect, any economists here? Just put your hand up. But I see he has two. But they always say about when economists are teasing lawyers, you never see a one-handed economist. Because they always see on the other side. But if you look at this side, on the other side, so my economist friend Leslie Scotland, I and mean, if you know him, Leslie always say yes, but so and so, but on the other side. But they try to get something equitable. So we have to look at how, from an equitable point of view, you do it. So that is, um, that is what you do. But, not the solution. But as a draftsman, I would say there is a solution. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm going just briefly to the field of legislative drafting. Once you get proper instructions, you do it. And that is why when the contribution was being made in the parliament, one of the distinguished parliamentarians, what well, I should say who it is because it's on Hansard, Dr. Rowley said, openly, he said, there are experts in Trinidad and Tobago who can assist with this draft. And he called my name. But um, the politicians know best, or they think they know best. Um, but he did call my name, and he said, why don't you call him on him? I'm still waiting for the call. Yes, sorry. Mr. Justice Lucky, mm -hmm. is there a similar situation in the US 
where they have defined federal lands and, and state lands. For example, I think the MMS, which is the Mineral Mines, they control the 12 miles and the Palestine of Louisiana, they will have the federal state limit, 12 miles and beyond that is more federal. So they can approach that. Way. You see, what? <laughs> Very good. <coughs> you see how we're discussing here? We are slowly, young people from um, Mr. McDowell, from Mr. Allen, from Mr. Tilagari, sorry, Palagari, Palagari Singh. What we are seeing is you're getting a, a view. Now, if I had to sit back as a draftsman, I would say, yes, Mr. Allen says, let me go and look and see how they did that. Mr. McDowell, let me see what they did in Canada. Let me bring it into a hodgepodge now. Mr. Palakdari Singh, yes, you said people should be informed. Um, let us put out, uh, what do you call it, a white paper, or let us put forward a bill. Let us ask for public comment. Let those who have an idea give an input, and we move from there. Because look right here, you are hearing, look at Canada, look at the United States. They were able to deal with certain aspects involving oil and law of the sea and so let us see let us see what we could get together and come up with something that could benefit the people of Tobago and Trinidad or Trinidad and Tobago. And that is how you get to uh, um, <laughs> what Mr. Paragari Singh raised earlier. Get public opinion and let the public become aware of what is happening. So you will see now that um, bearing in mind the constraints of time, that what rights are enshrined in the exclusive economic zone and what rights are enshrined for ar archipelagic states, all of it is set out in the, in the convention. And <coughs> it, all of it is set out in the convention and all of it is now forming part of the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. So all we have to do is to see how best we can put things together and get it done. Yes. When we look at the map in terms of the lines drawn from the uh, UK, the Charlotte, and so on, is there not uh, a greater, greater distances in terms of our, our, our what we call economic zones and so on? rather than separate and stand again with, with the synergies of both the and the people as an actual Yes, we, we would gain. Am I pressing the right thing? Yes. This little fella keeps running away. Yeah. You see with this line here? I'm just using here, or any one of them, you would measure your territorial sea from here and you will measure your exclusive economic zone from here, and you will measure it both from there. That's why I showed you the other map where you'll see an area showing where the territorial sea is. So the, the advantage is this. The advantage is being, if we want an archipelagic state, then you would measure from there, out. Well, <laughs> I would be against it because, just giving a, a private view, as somebody who's versed in this and applying the law, I would say that we would both those of Tobago who are very Tobagonian, and as a person who's very San Fernando, sorry, I love San Fernando over there, <laughs> very Trinidadian. I would say we would lose. Because if that happens, and I hope it never does, and I said so when I spoke in Tobago, I hope it never does, it means there's a cutoff. And everybody goes their own way, and we run into problems. Because some time ago, a French ship carrying nuclear waste was passing here and our foreign ministry objected when they filed the objection the ship has already passed here on the way to the panama canal another one was passing oops, 
it's gone. Another one was passing north of Tobago and the Coast Guard found out. And again, there was an objection. But what they do is when the ship passes, then they ask for permission. So when you file your objection, it's already gone. And it's, God forbid, from Barbados has indicated quite clearly that they want to know. Because like Tobago and Barbados, Barbados depends heavily on tourism. And God forbid, if there's a nuclear disaster or there were nuclear waste, then tourism goes because all the waters will be polluted. So the islands that are depending on tourism are strong objectors to any nuclear waste passing, no matter what precautions they take. And um, the, there's a group here that says, well, what about us? You know, are we concerned too? And yes, we are. But again, the papers do not print what we are doing. The papers, the newspapers do not print that Trinidad and Tobago was putting an objection to what is occurring with nuclear waste. The papers do not print and explain what, are the, what is the significance of an archipelagic state. The papers do not print that, um, that you know, we have to look at our oil reserves. They don't. They don't. You, you pick up the newspaper and you, what do they write about? Um, I read the newspaper and I say so. Um, we are six hours ahead during summer and for the two or three weeks when I'm up there doing a case. When I'm reaching at eight o'clock, I read the newspaper. And um, at one time I got so fed up that I sent a little email to the editor and said, on which page can I find something interesting? Because the most interesting part of each newspaper for me is the comic strip. And um, if I want, <laughs> and I don't get that. So I'm really looking for something edifying, something uplifting, you know, to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So does that answer your question? Any other problems? Yes. Is there any? <coughs> yes. If the nuclear ship is passing through the territorial sea or, or exclusive economic zone, we can, or we don't have the power, but you could block them. Or you could arrest the ship, but you know, you get objections because if you, the Coast Guard arrested a, a ship carrying nuclear waste and brought it into Shagaramas, there would be massive objections not to bring it there. The most you can do is draw it to the attention of the international community. And I assure you that the international community, um, there are people who read the newspapers from all over the world. And don't feel that, and this would help you, don't you feel that the world is a global village and it's shrinking? What happens in Trinidad is ready immediately in Singapore, Malaysia, Ghana, Nigeria. When I meet the judges, I'm sitting with 20 colleagues from all the geographical areas because for us, each geographical area must be represented. You have Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Caribbean. So we have judges from all over the world. In this area, you have Argentina, Brazil, Grenada, Trinidad, and Tobago. Mexico and Uruguay are looking for a seat because next year, Grenada, the, the judge from Grenada comes off and they already indicated that they want to get in. So when you meet these people, I was shocked that Judge Chandrasekhar Rao, who comes from Delhi, 
He says, ah, I see in Trinidad and Tobago you have this. I see in Trinidad and Tobago you have that. When I was in Beijing, I was shocked that the legal advisor in the ministry was telling me about Trinidad and Tobago and what we are doing offshore and that we entered into the first unitization agreement in the whole Western Hemisphere because nowhere have they, where you have a shared boundary, no country has entered into such an agreement. And the word goes around through Professor David Attard of the, of the Institute of Marine Affairs in Malta came to me and he said, listen, I hope you don't mind, but I read this and could we get a copy of the unitization agreement? So I called up here, the ministry, and they actually answered the phone. And I said, could I speak? Um, could I speak to the legal officer? And they put me through to his secretary and I said, this is uh, Judge Lucky, because I'm known abroad. Um, could I get a copy of the agreement? And to my surprise, they sent it. And I said, could I get a copy of the field I showed you, the Lorraine Manatee field? And they sent it. And I said, the reason for it is, um, Judge, Pro Judge Professor David Attard would like to have it, because he spoke to his prime minister. And the prime minister, Malta, said, could we get an agreement? Because Malta, as you know, has its neighbors, Libya, Italy, and they, they want such an agreement. So we sent it. We have nothing to hide. And, and so it went. And then the judge from Russia said, it's not the first agreement. And he said, we have one, but it pertains to the land with the Ukraine. So could we see it? And then the librarian says, could I have a copy? So we could see it. And Ghana and his neighbor says, could we have a copy? So we could see it because we want to share some things with our neighbors. And so what happens here goes abroad today. But does The Guardian, The Express, The Newsday, well, The Bomb, The Punch, The TNT mirror, do they put anything like that? You know, as one person put it, they, they deal with other maps. The punch would put maps of ladies. <laughs> so that's by the way. But do the media, because the literacy rate in Trinidad and Tobago is one of the highest in the world. I don't know if you know that. Everybody reads. And where do they get their information? Not everybody has a uh, those who get laptop computers either play games or they have to, um, I don't know what they look at, but where do they get the information? They get the information from the newspapers. You go around anywhere in the morning and you see everybody with a newspaper reading. And some people do read some things. They meet me and say, hey, I saw you on so-and-so and so committee. And um, hey, I didn't know about the case with the ship. So there are people who, they want to know. There's a thirst for knowledge. But in the thirst for knowledge, the fastest way to get it is in the newspaper. But, um, you know, you have to be very, very careful. You say something about the media, and the next thing you know is headline, Lucky criticizes the media in Trinidad and Tobago. Well, who is he to criticize the media in Trinidad and Tobago? And so you go into Bacchanal. So, you know, there are a lot of people who want to say things, they shut up. And they don't say anything. So, are there any other difficulties with the archipelagic principle? So if you get a question, they come and ask me. Give me a question so I could ask these people in the examination. I would say, question as follows. Do you think that being an archipelagic, archipelagic state is advantageous to Trinidad and Tobago? Answer. A question like that. Do you think that what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages, if any, of being an archipelagic state? You think about it. I'm not giving away questions, uh, Mr. Jai Paul Singh. <laughs> I'm just saying these are things that we have to be concerned about. You know, 
the regime of the continental shelf. What, you know, how is it, what are the, how is it related to being an archipelagic state? In the exclusive economic zone, what, how do you measure it? Between Trinidad and Tobago, you throw that trap question, is there a boundary? The answer will be no. So, you know, there's, there's much to come out from just that. And they, they call this the constitution of the oceans because the, the, it was drafted and it took them a very long time. They took the 1958 conventions on the law of the sea and they met and there were meetings in Geneva, in Caracas, and a lot of meetings at Montego Bay, where it was finally signed. And over a period, I remember Judge Yankov telling me that for months, they were re meeting every day. When they were in Caracas, they were surprised that Venezuela didn't sign. And they, they came up with this comprehensive draft. And it covers every single aspect of the law of the sea by which we are bound. And giving the, I'm letting the cat out of the bag, but this is the yearbook of my court, or the court in which I also preside. And in it, um, I'm giving it to the library here. You all can look up and see all the various things that we do. And uh, you will see in here all the various um, in the annexes, who sign what, and <coughs> who sign what, and who sign the treaty, and diplomatic privileges and immunities act um, convention, which has been signed by a lot of states. And when you look, even with the most powerful, you go to the Jodrell Bank radio telescope or any big telescope, and if you look inside, you'll see. See if you find Trinidad and Tobago. We still studying whether we should sign it. So there's a lot to be done. And you, you have to study things before you do it. My God. Ah, just before, I, I, I see my time is up. But um, I'm not asking for any fee, Mr. Jai Boston. <laughs> but I am quite willing and I mean, I am in Trinidad most of the time because I'm like a home in Pichon. You know, after two weeks in Hamburg, I want to come home. And, you know, the most I can stay abroad is three when they have been doing a case for a month. I'm fussy in the last week. And when we finish on the evening, like the last time we finished, I think, uh, nine o'clock at night, I was on a plane, half past four in the morning, the next morning, to come home. So there is really no place like home. If we could just go back to the top, just to finish off. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to show that <laughs> because if my name appears, um, this appears on the International Journal and forget it's me. Um, everybody knows I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, therefore Trinidad and Tobago sets out with the Libertad. In my separate opinion, it's just brief that Argentina claimed that a warship enjoys immunity and cannot be seized or arrested and the Libertad um, is to leave the port and to, that's a part of the judgment. Um, if you're going to read the whole thing, I just put it there. Sometimes you have to be an egotist and you know, bring your stuff with you so people can read it. And um, this is the uh, Argentinian arms sailors prevent, pick up and show them the whole thing. Another one, that is when they were attempting to board the ship. Now, look at it here. And I, I brought this for one reason. Remember that 450 to 500 foreign ships 
pass through the Gulf of Paria every year because they are going from Point Lisas, well, here, they're going from Point Lisas, Point of Pear, Port of Spain, Point Fortin, um, the liquefied gas goes through there and passes. There is, there could be the possibility of a ship being seized for, we are doing a case now, the MP Virginia, where the ship was seized in Guinea, um, Guinea Bissau because it, they said that they were refueling and it polluted the, um, the waters. And this was in the exclusive economic zone and they seized it. And we are now going to decide whether the seizure was valid or not. The photograph there shows what was happening because they pulled up the gang plank and this is the, um, the Argentinian uh, ambassador coming to tell the sailors, well, are you going to let them come aboard? And the sailors and the captain say, no, so you can go back to the... The judge in that instance was most interesting because you all asked Mr. Allen raised it about internal waters, what rights you have. Uh, judge. Yeah. Oh, that, that's not it. But yeah, that's the Libertad. No, the Libertad is a training ship. It was welcomed by the president of Argentina. But the point I want to make is this: that the learned judge, Judge Richard Frimpong of the Commercial Court in Tima, in, <coughs> in Ghana, made it very clear that the ship was in internal waters. And in the convention, and it turned out that some of our judges were actually involved in drafting the convention, they left out the immunity of warships in internal waters. Because a lot of states says, you, even if you're a warship, we don't want to give you immunity in our internal waters. Leave that for us to decide. But in the territorial sea and the exclusive economic zone and on the high seas, you have immunity, except during war. So Judge Richard Frimpong says, said at that time that in his view, the ship was seized and it's correct. And he's not going to order the release. And the judgment is interesting from the point of view is that Ghana said their lawyers among them, um, Professor Sands, QC of the UK. And Professor Sands says, but the judges should know, especially those in a common law system, that we have a separation of powers. And Judge Richard Frimpong, although the Minister of Foreign Affairs sent his senior legal officer, an ambassador to the UN, who addressed him and said, please release the warship. It's immune, and in those circumstances, this is the law, and could you release it? And that the minister has sent a message that he agrees with the release, so to the Attorney General. And do you know what Justice Richard Frimpong said? I am an independent judge. We recognize the separation of powers. You are in the internal waters of Ghana. Sovereignty is supreme. And in the circumstances, if the Honorable Attorney General or the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs orders that ship to leave, when I have an injunctive order that it remains, I will issue a warrant of arrest for each of them for contempt of court. That's what the man said in his judgment. They immediately backed down. But then Argentina had reached to us. And he held out. He says, if you want the ship, pay 20 million as a deposit because you owe 350. And we still ordered the release because we said it was immune. And what has slipped in, as it does happen with judges sometimes, is, and I would like to look at our Port Authorities Act, the act says that a warship is immune. So when it was pointed out to the Ghana Supreme Court that their law, internal law, which Frimpong says that's the law to apply, 
said our warship is immune. The Supreme Court agreed with us and said release the ship. And that's how it was welcomed in Argentina when it, when it came, this enthusiastic war for our warship. I just got a message, because this phone gets emails, that we gave provisional measure, but Argentina is insisting that it gets damages for having been insulted. They've asked that the Ghanaians give the Libertad a salute, recognizing its immunity, and they are seeking damages for the sailors that had to be, I think it's 315 in all on board, and they sent, they sent back um, 250, just kept them a minimum amount. Ghana allowed them to leave to go home, and there was a big parade when they all came back. But what's interesting is that to get the sailors home, the crew, they were sending the Tango One. Now, Tango One, you young people, is not a dance. Just like they have Air Force One, they call the presidential plane in Argentina Tango One. And Tango One was on its way to Ghana when their lawyer said, turn back. Because if Tango One had landed in Ghana, they would have seized it. Because it has no immunity, it's not a warship. So, as you know, even though they are very serious professor, professors, when we have the coffee break, you get a bit of a sense of humor. They said that was the most beautiful move they saw in a Tango, when Tango One turned and went back to Buenos Aires. But since then, they have gone home. So there's a lot to discuss. Um, several colleagues of mine, judges on the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, when you look at, at their, um, when you look at their biographies, etc., you will see their background because the Russian judge is an advice, special advisor to his government. The Ukrainian judge is a special advisor to his government. The judge from South Africa is a lecturer at the university. Judge Peck of Korea is a lecturer at the university in Seoul. Judge Gao of China heads a whole big maritime division in Beijing, but the Chinese can do anything. Um, <laughs> Judge Chandrasekhar Rao, well, he's writing quite a lot. He is a representative of India. Um, Professor Elsa Kelly of Argentina has just come off being advisor to her government. And if you run through all of them, you would see that they assist their country as far as they can, once it's not a matter that would end up coming before us. Um, Judge Cotta France is also a former lecturer at the Paris University, one highly recognized. And, you know, Judge Jose Luis Jesus, and they pronounce his name Jesus, so we call him Judge Jesus. And um, it's always interesting that once he was doing some special work for the president, and everybody in our building, which is huge, but there's security, so they always know where you are. In fact, I think they track us everywhere. They always know where you are when you're not even there. And um, when they ask where he is, a judge with a sense of humor said, what do you mean? Where is he? He's here. Are you, are you all not Christians? Well, a lot are not. And when they said, what do you mean? He said, but Jesus is always here. <laughs> and that was a little bit of humor that came about. And, um, but that's how his name is pronounced. And he is a former ambassador of Cape Verde, a former president when he was only 32 years old, he was the um, president of the Securities Council at the UN. So these, these are brilliant men. When, when I sit there, I'm humbled because, you know, the amount of things that they do. Judge Turk lectures all over the world. So they said, Judge Lucky, what do you do? Don't you lecture at the university? I said, yes. Well, how are your lectures? I mean, how you manage, you know, when you're up here? 
I said, what do you mean? You asked me if I lecture at the university, you know? They said, yes, you have an Institute of International Relations, University of the West Indies, you have a faculty at St. Augustine, you have the Hugh Wooding Law School, you must be very busy. I said, oh, yes, UTT invites me once a year. <laughs> and um, I'm being quite frank, you know. So they said, but don't you, doesn't your government, your ministry, ask you anything, you know, for you to make a contribution? I said, no, they don't, because they know everything. And um, when you say, well, look, what do you think of so-and-so? And the beautiful answer is, we know. I said, OK, Institute of International Relations, would you like me to come up and speak to you? I went once, three years ago. And um, during, the, during the lecture, I don't know if it was near carnival time, but there must have been about 20 people. 10 of them were sleeping. Five of them were drowsing, two were snoring, and the only three who listened were three in the front seat. So I continued with the lecture and I said, most probably, you know, it was seeping into their dreams. So I never went back. But it's so different. When I went to Venezuela, I was bombarded with questions. And um, in Beijing, you know, you get surrounded by, you know, you finish your, your speech and you come down and you have all the talk around you and then you're surrounded, imagine being surrounded by about 50 of these Chinese intellectuals all asking you questions at the same time in perfect English. So in Trinidad and Tobago, we know, we know everything. We, we know every single thing. We, we signed a treaty with Venezuela where the lawyers are brought us saying we shot ourselves in the foot. And uh, we made a mess of things in the arbitration award with Barbados. Half of the people say we lost, half people say we won. We have a, you know, Trinidad and Tobago, we know everything beautifully. So thankfully, I was asked by UTT to come here. And as Mr. Allen correctly said, we hope that what I've said would encourage you. But there's much more. This is a short time. In, when I speak to my colleagues, if you want to speak about concepts of the law of the sea, you need at least five lectures. And I've offered to give five, and Mr. Allen smiled broadly, and I've never seen such a broad smile on Mr. Jack Paul Singh's face <laughs> when I said, I will do it for free, and I was immediately handed a piece of paper and so signed this. <laughs> Which I would willingly sign, because I feel that I should not, I should share my views, because even if you disagree. And then we've had Mr. Roman McDowell, who I gave a designation, and he said, don't repeat it, because this is being taped. But I know that he, I'm not giving you a plug free, eh? but he is associated with Heritage Radio and his programs on Tuesdays and, yeah. Tuesdays and Thursdays afternoons. And um, he interviewed me once in the Law of the Sea, and he had a gentleman there who didn't know that I was speaking from my study with the convention there, so I could look at it. And, but it's an interesting interview, and they tried to bring home the people, but people prefer to look at other stations who make jokes and criticize people and so, whereas this is an intellectual process on Heritage Radio, which I appreciated and want. But the thing is, he plays it, puts it down, I'll end with this, is, and I apologize to you. You have that program on from four o'clock until six o'clock, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that's the time I exercise and play tennis to get my stomach flat. <laughs> so I want to thank you all very much. Um, here, I would like to say quite openly um, that when he found out that, well, Mr. Uh, Bennett McDonald, McDowell said immediately when he heard that he would come all the way from the Far East, and I'm certainly not speaking about um, Lebanon or Syria or Tunisia, but he came from that far and came down here. Um, I want to thank the student from Barbie, sorry, the I said student, not student, um, from Barbados, who's also here. I want to send my greetings and thanks to the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Dr. Keith Rowley, a geologist in his own right, who 
has asked and they immediately welcome them. So we have here senior legal officer and economist who I hope what I've said today would be useful for the future. As we move forward as the unitary state, the Republic of the Archip Republic of the Archipelagic State of Trinidad and Tobago. And thank you all very much for being here.